what happens to you know all the physical devices that you usually have to deal with um, on physical machines and in some cases with virtual machines and how those map into the container world and what's possible with all that stuff. So um, first of all, a very quick intro. I'm really sorry for anyone who was in Christian's talk uh, next door just before because that's going to be a bit repetitive. But um, in this talk, I'll mostly be focusing on what we call system containers. That is pretty different from the application container type model, which is what Docker, Rocket, and those type of different times do. Um, system containers tend to be better suited um, when talking, passing physical devices and dealing with like physical disks and NICs and all that kind of stuff because their main goal is to provide the same semantics around containers as you would usually get around a virtual machine or physical system. Um, system containers are the oldest type of containers. They started with BSD jails, then the similar approach was taken as a kernel patch called Linux V server. Solaris did something pretty similar to BSD jails, but with uh, networking sorted out, which BSD didn't quite have uh, when they implemented Solaris zones. Then we got OpenVZ, which was another big kernel patch set uh, on Linux to get system containers going. Um, after which work has happened in the upstream kernel community to get system containers, well, containers in general supported in Linux kernel, which in user space uh, led to the LXC project, um, which then evolved recently in a more user-friendly manner to, into the LXD project that we've got right now. Containers, like system containers, very much behave like a standalone system. They run an init system, they run a clean destroy images, they don't need any kind of specialized software that's container aware or any of that stuff. They don't need custom images, they don't need any of that. They will boot a full system exactly like you would on a normal machine um, or in virtual machine. The only difference being that they share the kernel with the host. Um, so long as you're not trying to run Windows or some other operating system, you can run them, you can run whatever Linux distro you want inside a system container. And there is no need for any kind of virtualization because it's, you know, you're dealing with containers after all. Uh, so it depends on any architecture, uh, even architectures that might not support any kind of virtualization extension. Um, and when talking, and we're going to go into more details after that, when talking about physical devices, that also means that you don't need any special um, firmware or hardware platform or any of that kind of stuff to support physical device pass-through. So for anyone who's been dealing with that in the VM world, you're usually looking at whether your hardware is VFI or capable. Um, and like whether your motherboard supports it, whether you've got the right setup of um, PCI lanes, like whether any lane is shared, that kind of stuff, uh, to try and, and get devices into a shape where you can move them into VMs. Um, with containers, we use a single kernel, so we don't need any of those um, hardware and firmware details at all. Um, now, I'm quickly talking about kind of, you know, use cases, like where, where in, in what cases might you actually need physical stuff? Uh, and we, we can virtualize a lot of things. Um, that's very nice. Um, but occasionally you do need to get down to hardware. And one of the most common use cases these days is really computation. When you, whenever you want to deal with GPUs, whether you're doing you know, deep learning type thing or you just want to get rich by, uh, mining coins, uh, and, whatever, whatever you like, uh, usually end up having to deal with GPUs. Um, you can do very fancy virtualized GPUs. If you, if you go with um, advanced server type models of GPUs, they, they can let you slice a card into different virtual chunks. Those virtual chunks show up as like virtual PCI devices and you can bind those to virtual machines. Um, but there's still some overhead of all of that. Um, whether like this, slicing is dynamic or not, like how you actually assign resources, and then the fact that you have to pass those to virtual machines, that can be a bit painful. There may be some overhead. You may not want to buy a multi thousand dollars card just to be able to do that, um, especially when you know, all your virtual machines are going to be running Linux anyways. So this GPU is like one of the pretty big use cases um, that we've got for, for any kind of device pass through in NXT uh, and system containers in general. Um, the other thing you usually run into is very fast networking. Um, 
that's the cases where you want to pass devices that are capable of like 40 or 100 gigabit um, connectivity, or possibly if you're doing the H HPC type workload, you might care about features like RDMA to directly access um, memory from different hosts on the network. Those you could also pass through uh, PCI pass through, but either you need a very fancy card that lets you do virtualization and slicing, or you need to have one physical card per virtual machine on your system, which not always um, that great a fit, really. Um, and there are then a whole bunch of other devices that more people tend to deal with day to day. I mean, you might, like in your company, I don't know, you might be doing Android app development. You might want to be able to test your code against physical devices. Sure, you can get a bunch of Raspberry Pis and connect stuff to them. That's that's perfectly fine. But you could also get like some beefy servers and just attach all your devices to that, and then dispatch those physical USB devices to whatever container is running a given test against it. Um, so USB pass through is, is very useful for that kind of stuff. It also some of the environments it means you can pass access to scientific uh, equipment, be that like fancy scales or whatever you might have in a lab. Um, those tend to be uh, pretty simple serial USB type devices that are pretty damn trivial to pass um, to a container as well. And then you've got some of the weirder cases. I mean, you've got things like HSMs. Uh, for anyone who, who needs to store private keys very securely, you might have a container that you want to do your key management in that doesn't have any kind of internet access but needs to have access to the HSM. So that can have like files dumped into it do signing and then push the file back out or something like that. And then even weirder cases, um, like phone cards. Um, it, it's not uncommon for companies to still get a good old T1 or similar type uh, phone lines. And that usually means either you've got a physical PBX or you've got something like asterisk running with a fancy phone card. Um, and again, like you, Maybe you're willing to waste a full machine just to run your PBX, but maybe you're not. Um, and if you've got infrastructure server, you might as well just run all that stuff inside a container rather than running it um, on a dedicated machine. And storage is always also a pretty important part of that. Um, very, very fast storage and virtual machines doesn't tend to align always that well. Um, for anyone who's been dealing with cloud instances, IO performance tends to be a bit of a bottleneck. And usually turn to physical machines whenever you need to deal with really, really fast storage, be that you know, NVMe or whatever else. Again, um, system containers will let you have something that feels like exactly your virtual machine or your own tiny cloud or something or not, but be running um, like on single directly um, with the hardware directly, uh, talking directly to the hardware rather than having to go through X layers of virtualization and in direction. Um, so that's some of the points I also kind of went through already to some extent, like how the old device pass through works for containers, rather than what you would usually get with like a virtual machine, where you pass the PCI device or you pass an, the actual device to it, and then you need to load your drivers in there that will then interact with the virtual device and then eventually access the hardware. Um, in a container, the kernel will just load on the host whatever modules needed to talk directly to the hardware, and then the device nodes that show up as a result of that are then exposed to the containers that you want to have access to that. That means no virtualization anywhere along that path, direct hardware access if you want it. You just need your host kernel to have support for whatever device you just attached. The um, Tricky part to some extent is figuring out exactly what device nodes you need to get and move into the container. That's especially difficult with GPUs. When you've got a system that's you know, got a mix of multiple vendors of cards, um, some of which come with drivers that give you extra device nodes, things like NVIDIA's, they are dev NVIDIA type devices. Um, that needs some extra logic to try and figure out exactly what is tied to a specific piece of hardware. Um, but once you do, it's pretty simple to then move those into the, into the container. The very interesting um, feature that you get from all of that, uh, especially when talking GPUs, is that you can share uh, those devices with as many containers as you want without needing like any fancy hardware feature to try and do slicing and that kind of stuff. Um, Linux will perfectly let you have 
like 10, 15, whatever pieces, uh, different processes talk to the same uh, dev NVIDIA node for rendering. And there's then nothing wrong with having multiple containers that all see the exact same device. Um, sure, they will eventually, um, they, they will share time on the card itself, but you can do it. Um, and then it's effectively up to you whether you want to allow that or not, rather than up to whatever the hardware gets you. And the other thing that's pretty interesting is that you can attach and detach those devices on the fly exactly when you want it. You don't need to take the system, in our case the container, down to replace hardware, um, you know, remove a card, add a card, that kind of stuff. Um, usually hot plugging into a VM is pretty reliable. That part works pretty well. Uh, removing from a VM, not always so much. And if you're dealing with physical hardware, then yeah, like you don't really want to start hot plugging and hot removing the uh, hardware from your running server. Um, the, the bulk of this talk is going to be going through um, a demo of like, all of those different features and the way they work in LexD. So I just want to quickly go through what LexD is before we do that. Um, LexD is, as I mentioned, an evolution of LexD, uh, of LXC. That means it's a modern container manager. It's got a REST API. It's got nice scripting. It's fast by default. Uh, it uses optimized storage for any kind of storage drivers that you might think of. Like we support ZFS, BORFS, LVM, Ceph, directory based uh, type storage. And knows um, how to do like extremely efficient cloning of containers and copying of containers, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's secure by default. We use every single kernel security features it can think of. Um, like all the LSMs, uh, we also use uh, C groups for um, restric restricting resource usage. We use um, the unprivileged, all our containers are unprivileged by default, which means the, that root inside your container is not real root outside of it. Um, we use all the namespaces as well to get you like as safe a container as you can possibly think of. And it's designed to be very scalable. So while the demo I'm going to give you is on a few individual systems with a few containers, it works just as well if you've got hundreds of different systems with running each hundreds to thousands of containers. Um, and because it's a networked type daemon, it does support moving your containers from one host to another and using one of your hosts as an image server for the others, all of those kind of um, nice network interactions you can think of. As far as what we support for device pass through in LexD, uh, we've got five um, device types right now. Well, six technically. Um, we've got NIC, which is network interfaces that we support virtual interfaces. So that just means your normal Linux bridge plus a virtual device that's connected to it. That's the default mode. But we do support passing a physical device through. So your device node just disappears from the host and shows up in the container effectively. For disks, we support um, either set just effectively by mounting a path from your host into the container. So you can say that you want home, your username, some directory show up as slash mnt in the container, and like, they will do it for you. Or you can point to a physical block device, be that a full disk or partition, and just have Lexd mount that for you at a given path in the container. For GPU, we support passing existing GPU. Uh, we figure out what DRI render nodes we need to move, um, and whether there's anything additional like the CUDA type devices that we also need to expose to the container, and we do that for you as well. For USB devices, um, anything that's supported by libUSB, so that's anything that looks at dev bursts. USB and accesses those device nodes, we support as well. So you can effectively configure a container saying that anything that's plugged, which has that product ID and vendor ID, just pass it to the container. Um, or you can even say anything that's from that product ID needs to, uh, vendor ID needs to be passed to the container. If you've got multiple devices, um, like if a given piece of so, uh, hardware shows up as like three different devices, all from the same vendor, you can have them all automatically be passed to the container. And we support um, hot plugging for USB as well. So as soon as LexD notices that that particular device has been plugged into the host, it just passes it to container immediately. There's no need to restart or anything else. And for low level uh, type use cases, we also support passing just any Unix character device or Unix block device that you might think of. Um, some of the use cases there is I usually run my uh, virtual machine hosts inside LexD containers, so install libvirt. Um, inside a Lexi container, and then I pass devkvm from the host into the container. 
All right, so that was the boring speech. Um, now let's go look, look at how that thing actually works. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be big enough. The problem is that if it's a niche bigger than that, then tables and stuff don't render anymore. Um, so I'm hoping that will do the trick. Um, the first thing we will look at is just going to install LexD on a test system real quick. Um, so just downloading latest version of LexD um, and installing that using the LexD snap package in this case. But we also have native packages and whatnot. Yeah, and it works a bit slower than it was earlier too. Cool, man. Whenever you prepare your demo, you're downloading at like 20 megabytes a second, and everything is great. And when you actually do it, then internet goes to being seriously. Are you kidding me? Okay, it's just oh, it might just be internet being down. That would explain it, I guess. Uh, that would also be very sad. Because I can show some stuff locally, but I don't have a GPU uh, that I can really do anything useful with on this machine. So that would be pretty unfortunate. Um, all right. Fine, I'm going to bounce the Wi-Fi and see if I'm, I get lucky. If not, I'm just going to demo whatever I can locally, but that would be unfortunate. Yeah, I just reconnected and it seems to be working way better. Uh, okay, now reconnecting VPN. VPN's back on. Come on. Come on, SSH, you're reconnected. You should do something about it. Do I seriously have to reconnect? Oh, yay, look around. All right, so LexD is installed. Uh, that was a bit harder than I thought it would be, but it is. Um, just going to do the initial config for LexD, uh, which usually involves pressing Enter quite a few times. It's effectively going to create you a new storage pool. Um, uses ZFS in this case by default. Um, creates a default bridge with default um, unused subnet for IPv4 and IPv6. There we go, it's created. Um, now let's create a container. I'm just going to use, say, a CentOS 7 image, because why not? Ah, that's how network's supposed to work. There we go. Um, OK, so if we list right now, the container only has an IPv6, driven an IPv4 soon. There we go. So that container um, just created on default LexD, which means it only has, um, it's connected to a local bridge. It doesn't have any physical devices on it, that kind of stuff. Um, we can list its entire config and see what's going on there. Um, you might see down in devices, there's if zero. We see it's connected to LexDBR zero type bridged. OK, um, so that's the default config. Now let's change that a bit. I do have a awkwardly named ENP 11 s zero, I think. Yeah, uh, so physical device on that spe specific machine I'm not using right now. So I'm going to tell um, LexD to replace the if0 device I've got in that container with that device instead. Uh, now, I'm just going to bring it down and bring it back up, At which point we'll see how long the HTTP decides to take today. Um, took a while earlier. But the idea is that the container hasn't been stopped or anything. It's just it's if zero has been effectively removed, a new one has been moved directly from the host um, in place um, with the exact same name. I'm now inside the container. I'm just trying to bounce networking without restarting the container because I thought it would be faster. But maybe not. Shall see. It, yeah, there we go. So it did something that it should have an IP before. It does. So we see, um, well, if you remember it, uh, it, the IP before was in a 10 dot something subnet. Uh, which is what the bridge, uh, default bridge uses. Now it's connected directly on um, physical network, which is a 172.17 in this case. Now, um, 
this one is not really related to hardware pass through. It's kind of just for kicks because it's always fun. Um, so, whoops, what's going on here? One copy paste not working today. There we go. Okay, so I'm removing the if zero device added earlier, and I'm gonna re-add it, but connect it to the original bridge, and then restart that one container. Okay. Yep, there we go. It's back connected to the bridge. And I'm going to enter the container. There we go. And I'm going to be downloading a file from the local network. We can see it's loading at about 110 megabits per second. Uh, actually, no, it's megabyte. So it's loading at gigabit uh, rate from the network. Um, what I can do now is I can dynamically add a setting on that device, which is limit ingress 10 megabit. And we'll see the speed going down and down and down and down and down. Oh, there we go, 10 megabit. Um, oops. Or we can move it, I don't know, 100. And we see, oh, the file might actually finish the loading, unfortunately. But it's going back up. Yeah, it, it almost reached 100 megabit again just before finishing. Um, so that's for the network stuff. We can pass any network device you've got on your host. If they are physical NICs, just pass them in, and they behave exactly like any normal network device as far as NICs is concerned. Now, let's go take a, oh, I'm in the container. Um, it's a bit laggy. There. Um, creating a new container, this time Gen 2, because why not? Um, to look at uh, passing through disk devices and how that looks like. I swear the node was faster when I tried the demo earlier. Yeah. Also, Gen 2 is surprisingly big. All right. <laughs> I mean, at least it's not recompiling itself when you launch it. So, yeah, there's that, but. Oh. Um, Two takes a little bit of time once it reaches 100%, because since I'm using ZFS, it means it's unpacking the image and creating a ZFS data set, um, which then allows creating containers very cheaply from that point on, but the initial image import always takes a bit longer because of that. And apparently, Gen2 is rather big. Come on. Seriously? Yay, okay, so Gen2 is finally started. Um, the first thing we do is pretty simple, just I want to expose slash home from the host into that demo disk container I created at the mount point mount slash A. So I'm just gonna do that, uh, and then I can um, enter the container and look at what we've got in slash mount. We've got a directory, and inside it we see my home directory. Um, that's a pretty simple, case of just passing through any path you want from your host. Um, next, I'm going to format with X4 a uh, spare SSD I've got on that given system. And then tell LXD I want to expose um, that dev SD device into the container under the mount point B, um, also in the slash mount. So if we look at slash mount, um, we've got B. It's got, just got the last and found because it just got formatted. But we can see at the bottom that it's dev SD is mounted on mount B. Um, and lastly, for storage, let's try and do something even more fun. Uh, we recently added support for Ceph in LXD. So I'm creating a new storage pool in LXD itself. Um, so now if I list my storage pools, we can see the default is ZFS. That's what was created at install time. But then we've got Ceph that has been added there. Now I'm going to allocate a new volume on Ceph called data. It always takes a bit of time because of the Ceph cluster needing to replicate and whatnot. There we go. And now we can attach that particular Ceph data volume to the demo disk container with a device called C mounted at mount slash C. And go in the container. And if we look at mount, we've got C that's in there, lost and found again. And if we look at DF, we see that dev RVD0 is mounted on mount C. So that's a Ceph volume that's attached uh, to that container. 
that can be very useful for people who need to like store big databases or whatnot and need a replication and clustering and whatnot of Ceph. You can very easily attach Ceph volumes to your containers. Um, uh, this time, let's try Arch Linux. I'm going to run out of this choice pretty soon. So the next thing I want to show is passing through uh, Unix devices. That's what LexD tends to do for you with all of the other abstractions layer level we've got. But this thing um, lets you attach anything else that you might come up with, like any weird device that you've got that we've never heard of. If it's got a Unix character device or Unix plug device, which is usually pretty safe bet, you can pass it through with that. Um, the first example I'll go with um, is KVM. So I'm going to attach to my Unix um, demo Unix container, a new device called KVM. That's a Unix character device at dev KVM. And now I'm inside the container. And if I look at slash dev, I don't have much in there, but I sure do have a, de a KVM device. Um, now I don't really have the time to install it, but I could install QMU there and then run virtual machines from inside that container. And the container itself is completely unprivileged. There's nothing running a real route in there. It just has access to the dev KVM device. The other thing we can do is Unix plug devices. So in this case, I'm passing dev SDE um, directly to the container. Same thing. If I go look in slash dev, we now have dev SDE. And you could format it or do whatever you want with it, um, except mount it, which is a bit awkward. But unprivileged containers are not allowed to mount block devices, uh, except for very limited file systems. So if you've got something that uses Fuse, it can interact with it. Um, X4 in Ubuntu, you've got the kernel um, module option that lets you bypass that particular kernel check and lets you mount X4 if, if you want to. Um, but all other systems don't allow it. The, um, just like a safety feature, you don't, because that effectively allows an unprivileged user to mount a block device hitting the kernel um, super block passing code. They could handcraft a nasty block device that would then effectively execute kernel code. So that's not allowed by default. You could make the container privileged, at which point you would be allowed to mount. OK, that's it for this particular machine. Um, the next thing I want to show um, is GPU. So we've got another system that's got um, two NVIDIA GPUs we can see there. Um, unfortunately, they're two of the same, so it's not nearly that great to see which has been passed or that kind of stuff. But that host has two NVIDIA GPUs. We also have one container running on there called CUDA. Now, if I go in that container and I run SMI, we'll see it fails because the container itself doesn't have any GPU yet. But I can tell LexD to pass me a GPU. In this case, it passes the first one. So it said ID0. Um, and that is not working. That's a bit special. Um, Fine. Uh, I'm just assuming it's the index that's confusing it temporarily. Uh, let's just try that. Yep, there we go. Oh, I think I know why. Uh, let me just recheck whether I'm right. Uh, I believe that system used to just have two GPUs, but I think now it's got three. And zero, I'm guessing, is an Intel GPU. Um, so assuming that's the case, that means that if I remove that GPU, oops. So I removed the GPU. Now I'm going to re-add it, but this one will go with index 1, which should be an NVIDIA GPU, which means it should show up there. There we go. It's much better. Um, and now uh, I should be able to add another one. I need to give it a, a name, so GPU 1 with ID 2. And there we go. That's much better. OK. Uh, and that means that in there we've got card 1, card 2. And if I now pass 0, Zero will not show up in NVIDIA SMI because it's an Intel GPU, I think. Um, but it does show up as a DRI node. So you could do open C, uh, OpenCL or something against it if you wanted to. That's kind of that's the same way like uh, that an AMD GPU would show up. Uh, they don't have a specific device node for compute, but they do show up as render nodes on the DRI. Um, now for actual computation stuff, we can run one of the simple benchmarks from um, NVIDIA CUDA. Just run does a quick bend with test against the GPU. Um, just to show what I mentioned earlier, I can copy that container, creating a second one of it. 
and then start that second container. It takes a little bit of time because it needs to rewrite a whole bunch of stuff on the file system real quick, and that system is a bit slow. But the idea is that the CUDA container is still running. It has those GPUs attached to it. I copied it, which means it got CUDA 1 has now the exact same config and can see the exact same GPUs as the first container. So if you had some reason to, um, to run different workloads and not really care about dedicated GPU time, you can just share the same GPUs with as many containers as you want. And lastly, in the demo, uh, this time I'm actually on my local laptop, so I'm sure that the network is not going to be a problem this time. Um, I've got my cell phone here. I've got a container that's running that's called Android Dev here. Um, that container has the Android tools installed. So if I run ADB devices, uh, that's going to scan what it's got on the USB bus and tell me I've got nothing, um, which is kind of expected since the phone is not connected anyways. But now if I was to connect it, Right. I need to enable um, USB debugging on the phone itself so that it works for, so that it can work with ADB. So turn on development and turn on USB debugging. There we go. So now the phone, if I look on my laptop itself, I should be able to see a Sony device. There we go. It's showing up on USB. It's still not showing up in the container. That's because I've not passed it to the container. So I can tell LexD that I want to pass to that Android dev container a new device called phone that's a USB device with the vendor ID and product ID I showed earlier. Now the phone device has been passed. Um, on my phone, it now shows the prompt um, for the security key for the container, which means that it's, got, it's found something, but it's offline, so it's not trusted on the phone yet. OK, now it is means I should be able to do, uh, didn't I trust it hard enough? Because it should prompted, let's try that. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this is some convincing. Um, so now I can run ADB shell and I get the, I shell onto my container. What got what happened in the, the hood there is dev bus USB device. I should actually just do fine on that. Um, you can see the device, the device node was created under there, which is for my phone. Now, if I unplug the phone, Legacy will detect that and remove it immediately. And if a device is connected that matches the configured pattern, then it just, they just get created immediately whenever it's plugged in. And that's it for just about all the devices um, that we support passing through right now. Um, and I've got five minutes left, so it seems to work out pretty well. Um, just to recap kind of uh, what, I, what I showed till now, the, we can really pass just about any device into the container. Um, the only real requirement is that your host kernel must support it. So if it's some fancy piece of hardware that requires its own kernel module that you need to hand compile and load, it only works if you can have whoever runs your host to do that for you. Um, so long as they do, you can pass it to your container. Um, just figure out what device nodes are needed. If it's a GPU, USB, or USB device, we've got nice abstractions that do all of that stuff for you. If it's something fancier, then you just need to figure out what the, the actual path under dev is, and you can pass that to the container, and your container can then access that without any of the usual overhead. The, all of that stuff doesn't require any kind of fancy hardware. You don't need VFIO, you don't need um, like the right version of BIOS and motherboard and all of that stuff that usually comes in with trying to do that stuff with virtual machines. Um, because we don't need to virtualize PCI devices effectively. We just pass the resulting device nodes. None of that stuff applies. You can use consumer grade hardware if you want to, and it just works. And we can share those devices with as many containers as you want. Um, it's pretty simple. It just, the device nodes are exposed to more than one container. So long as the kernel driver supports uh, multiple accesses, it's going to work fine. If the kernel driver doesn't support it, the first container attaches to it. The second one gets a usually pretty clear error message coming back from the kernel saying that it's already being used, and they can try again later. 
And so that's it for, for what I've got here. Um, it was really, my goal here was really trying to show you that system containers are, in a lot of cases, very good replacement for virtual machines. So it, in my mind, it doesn't really make sense uh, for people to run Linux on Linux, like running a Linux virtual machine on top of Linux. In most cases, you don't really need to do that. Uh, you could use a container and not get any of the overhead um, and complexity that comes with that. There are some cases where you need it uh, because of special kernel modules, because you need some very specific kernel version or something like that, or because you need to run an op other operating system, or you've got some very specific security constraint, maybe. Um, but in the bulk of cases, you can use containers just as you would virtual machines, and you don't get any overhead. You get crazy uh, density with that. And it's also usually much simpler and faster. Um, so that was really it for my talk. I do have a bunch of FlexD stickers if any of you like those. Um, and that's it. Does anyone have any, have any questions for me? So when you say share a path through device is different containers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, each container, you see uh, the same device name, or they are multiple virtual devices? Um, in the container, they will always, like we, you can call them whatever you want, really. It doesn't matter. Um, for the GPU case, um, when you say that you want uh, the first card, then we will align it uh, at the DRI level because there are occasionally some weirdnesses. Like if we renumbered things, like if you say pass us the second card and we were to show it as card zero, that would confuse some um, software that would be going to slag, slash sys to get some extra information. That, that might be problematic. Um, so we usually pass it as it is, as far as naming. And We've not really run into any problems there. Okay. Yeah. So I forgot to mention that, like, the physical NIC is that's the one case where sharing is tricky, <laughs> because the the way the the way it works at the kernel level is that a single NIC can um, network interface can only be in a single network namespace. So if you move it to a container, it actually disappears from the host. And that's the one case where that does happen. If you want to share it, the only way you can really do it is by creating a bridge on the host, bridging that SNCC in there, and then attaching containers. Um, it is the one case where you can't just share a device node effectively, because NICs don't have device nodes in their dev. They're their own kind of structure. Yeah, so if you, so if, yeah. What you can always do is, if you do have the fancy hardware, you can configure the fancy hardware to show as a bunch of physical network devices on the host. So say you would have one physical network card that would then show up as like 10 if type devices on the host, then you can dispatch those into your containers. Um, but if you've got a card that cannot do that split um, by itself, then you should bridge it and then bridge the containers into it. Or you can use MacVLAN. We also support MacVLAN directly at LexD layer, which might be faster um, than straight bridging given that some of, most of the new cards are capable of, at the hardware level, listen for more than one MAC address, um, which is like the usual, that's a big bottleneck with bridging. If you bridge, it usually means you go into promiscuous mode, which then means a lot of overhead because all your, the traffic from the NIC actually hits the kernel. If you use Mac VLAN, you don't need to enter promiscuous mode until um, you actually hit the, uh, the number of MAC addresses that a given NIC can listen for. And that means that the card itself doesn't send un only sends the traffic that the kernel needs and not everything else. Hmm? How the packet was processed when you It does the exact same thing. I mean, as far as Linux is concerned, you'd still have processes. You still have some fancy namespacing around it, but it's instead of being in the host network namespace, you're in the containers network namespace, and but it's still a process, still a single process actually listening, and just still goes exactly the same code path. So the protocol stack is in the container. Hmm? So the protocol stack is in the container. It depends what you're. It depends what you're doing. I mean, you. It's the exact same. You get the exact same thing as you would a normal network device on Linux. It shows up as an if, like as an ethernet device. The kernel does um, all of the network. The network stack is still in the kernel. 
and in your container you bind a given address and you're going to get your connections onto it. That, that part's no different. Yeah, the, the packet, just as it usually would, will hit the network card, will be for arrive in the kernel, in the kernel driver for the network, um, for that network card. It will go into the normal um, kernel networking stack, and at that point, the, the only thing is that what's bound, like, it will do the normal TC, uh, like IP stack, figure out what IP it's targeted to, whether that port is bound by something. The only thing is that all of the, um, all of the net filter thing is namespaced, so all of the firewalling and all that stuff is per container. So it's gonna know that since that NIC is in that particular container, it needs to go through that net filter set of rules rather than the host, and then it will go and see what whether there's something bound to that given IP and port, and will hit it uh, at the process level exactly as it normally would. Uh, shared GPU. The main benefit is that like, you, you do have a bunch of, so you might have some cases where, say, you're in development lab or something, and you've got one machine that's got a couple of big GPUs, and you've got 20-something people that may want to run some workloads against that. Um, if they've got raw access to the machine, they might just mess it up by installing crap all over the place. Uh, with containers, the, it's their own thing. So if they break their user space, well, they just broke themselves. They, don't, they didn't break anyone else. Um, and Yes, it would be nicer for them to have a dedicated GPU because then they would have guaranteed timing and performance, but that's very expensive. So for development environments, it tends to be nicer for them to just be able to hit some shared GPUs, do their test against that, and if you want to go to production and then want something that's always got the exact same performance, then you can just pass a single GPU per container and get guaranteed performance. No, you, you can pass it to multiple containers. They all see it's the exact same thing as running multiple uh, processes that are talking to your GPU on a normal laptop, effectively. You can have more than one piece of software do rendering at any given time. You can have more than one container doing rendering at any given time. Uh, it's just that you share the GPU memory and CPU time. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, the, in the vast majority of cases, it's really um, you, like GPU, you could do it for a long time by knowing exactly what devices you needed to pass. Um, but that was a bit awkward, so we added abstraction on top of it to make it nicer. And that's the kind of thing we might end up doing for other devices. But usually, there's really nothing to do. It's like you just plug some device, it shows up as some device node in slash dev, you can just pass that into the container. The, the only case where you might want kernel development is if a device would, in theory, be able to have multiple connections to it, but the kernel does not support that, then you might want to try and get that resolved so that you can have multiple containers talking to it at the same time. Um, but that's, again, that wouldn't be any different than having multiple processes talking to it on the host directly. So, so if you're, for example, trying to have a GPM to security, and it whatever. Yep. Yeah, you should be able to pass dev TPM to multiple containers if you want to. Whether it's a good idea or not, that, that might depend, but yes. <laughs> uh, we're out of time, so um, if anyone has more questions, we can talk outside. There are stickers there if you want them. Thank you very much.